Hello, my name is Adam Tyson, MD. I'm a generalist obstetrician gynecologist. I spend about two-thirds of my time on labor and delivery. We're going to talk today about postpartum hemorrhage, and it's really going to be just sort of a introduction to an approach to how you evaluate a postpartum hemorrhage and the initial management of it. This is primarily aimed at a vaginal delivery, although there is some overlap with um, cesarean delivery as well. And we we'll talk about things that are applicable to uh, both of those situations. Um, just to <clears throat> give an idea of the, the scope of the problem, worldwide postpartum hemorrhage accounts for 25% um, of all maternal deaths attributable to childbirth. Um, it happens in about 2% of all births. Now in the United States these numbers are a little lower and the absolute risk of death is lower, but it's still a significant problem leading to serious morbidity and a number of medical interventions that might otherwise have been avoided. Um, and so it is a, a fairly common problem. It's one that we all need to be prepared to handle. The initial approach to postpartum hemorrhage isn't that difficult, but there are a few things you need to remember. Several organizations use the four T's of postpartum hemorrhage as a mnemonic to help us to recall what we need to do. These are listed in the descending order of frequency and importance. The first of these is tone, and this is to remind us that uterine atony can result in about 75 to 80 percent of all of the uh, postpartum hemorrhages we see. The atony can come from anything really which causes the uterus to contract inefficiently after delivery or to have flaccid um, smooth muscle. This can be anything that distends the uterine cavity like multiple gestations. It could be due to infection. It could be due to oxytocin use. For example with the induction or augmentation of labor. It can be iatrogenic due to the use of other drugs, particularly magnesium, which is one that we, we use frequently and we need to remember. Uh, and a special case of atony is that related to uterine inversion. So you'll need to be aware of these as possible causes. Now, these account for the vast majority of most of your cases, but there are uh, some other things as well. The next one in order of importance is trauma. And this could be about you know, 10 to 15 percent of your cases generally. And trauma usually involves the lower genital tract. So you would expect um, perineal or vaginal lacerations. But don't forget there's also the cervix. And in some cases, um, particularly if the patient is having a vaginal birth after cesarean, uh, you need to consider the hysterotomy and the possibility of uterine rupture. These are less common, but uh, you do need to consider that. Remember also that trauma is much more common with instrumented delivery, such as forceps or vacuum, and also with the use of episiotomy. So those would be two factors to consider as you're, as you're considering the cause of your hemorrhage. The third thing to consider is tissue. And again, this probably counts for about 10% of the cases. By tissue, we are largely referring to retained placenta. And that would be the biggest cause. A subset of that would be the placenta accreta, uh, increta, or percreta, uh, which are subsets of that. Um, this is something that we do have to consider any time uh, the first two don't seem to be uh, applicable to our case. And then finally, there's thrombin, and these are going to be coagulopathies, either congenital or acquired. The congenital um, coagulopathy that you might think about the most would be hemophilia. Hopefully, you'll have some warning about this before uh, you are actually treating the patient, but you may have a surprise you know, in case where the patient comes in in an emergency and you don't know a lot about the history. Acquired th um, thrombophilias are actually going to be more common in this case, and these are going to be um, cases such as a placental abruption or um, another hemorrhage, which leads to consumptive coagulopathy or DIC. 
It could also come from severe preeclampsia or the HELP syndrome or other deficiency of platelets. So these are going to be largely acquired and um, you may or may not know the risk factor ahead of time. So keeping these things in mind and keeping in mind that tone is really the biggest percent or the biggest component of these, a reasonable approach to postpartum hemorrhage is to administer uterotonic drugs first. The um, management of the postpartum hemorrhage can begin with this. Now, it, our practice is generally to administer oxytocin in a dilute solution, usually 20 to 40 units in a liter of fluid, as a preventive measure, but that, that may not be enough, so you'll have to consider whether you need to give an additional drug. But really, the medications are the way to treat the tone. So when you're faced with a patient with postpartum hemorrhage, the first thing to remember are just the basics, your ABCs. Do you have adequate IV access to deliver fluid, blood, and medications? Is um, the patient um, stable? You know, is, is she perfusing? What are her vital signs? You know, these are just basic uh, things you need to remember. And although we define postpartum hemorrhage technically as greater than 500 milliliters of blood loss, really in practice a postpartum hemorrhage is anything which causes these to be um, disrupted or malfunctioning. So if the patient is hypotensive, if she's becoming tachycardic, if um, she is starting to show effects of uh, lack of perfusion, then for all practical purposes you have a postpartum hemorrhage regardless of your measured blood loss. Now this can be tricky because um, the pregnancy physiology can actually mask the signs and symptoms up until your blood loss becomes very large. So you could lose well more than a liter before you actually start to see any compromise of the ABCs. And do remember that the uterus maintains about a third of the uh, blood flow, the cardiac output, at term. And so there can be a large, massive amount of bleeding. So be prepared to deal with these things. Get additional help from nursing staff, anesthesiology, or um, additional physician backup if you need to. But a reasonable approach is that while you're assessing the ABCs and addressing those needs that you administer an, an um, uterotonic drug, oxytocin is really the preferred drug because it's safest, it has the lowest side effect profile, although given in too rapid a bowl as it has been associated with hypotension, so be careful with that. If oxytocin isn't enough, your other choices are drugs such as methyl organivine or prostaglandins. And there are different prostaglandins which are available. Mesoprostol is one, and it's really more um, useful as a preventive measure, not in the face of active bleeding. But um, prostaglandin um, F2-alpha or carboprost um, is available as a rapid-acting prostaglandin, which can be helpful in an emergency situation. So if you start with this, that gives you time to assess the uterine tone. And if you have determined while you're administering the oxytocin that your tone is adequate, you can then move down the line to trauma. And this would involve an inspection of the lower genital tract. So remember to look inside the vagina. Um, I always tell our students and residents that the, the most common laceration that we miss is the second one. We see the perineal laceration, we repair it, and we miss the one that was deeper in the vagina. So pay attention to the fornices of the vagina because the laceration can hide in there. And also be aware of um, what I would call an occult laceration being a hematoma forming behind the vaginal wall. The other place to look is the cervix because that can be another source of um, a significant bleeding. Consider this particularly if you've had a malpresentation or malposition or if you've had a compound uh, presentation, say with a hand presenting alongside the fetal head. And again, don't forget the second laceration. If you've addressed this issue and found that there are no um, repairs which need to be done or that you have adequately addressed the hemostasis and you, and you still have bleeding, then you need to consider tissue or the retained placenta. And this may involve exploring the uterine cavity and this can be done with a sterile uh, glove, um, 
and a moistened laparotomy sponge and you basically just place your hand inside the uterine cavity through the cervix and you can feel for um, the presence of uh, any tissue. A second consideration is whether uh, the hysterotomy, if there, this is a case of vaginal birth after cesarean, is intact. We don't routinely palpate the hysterotomy, but in the case of a hemorrhage, it might be wise to do so if you suspect that that could be the cause. Um, do remember that this is going to be rather uncomfortable for your patient and ensure that you have adequate anesthesia on board. Um, ultrasound can be used as an alternative if you don't want to um, perform a manual exploration or it can be an adjunct to manual exploration if you have the time to get the ultrasound uh, in the room to do this. So if you've done all of these uh, three things and you can't find any source of the bleeding, the last thing you need to consider is thrombin, which is to remind you of the clotting defects. Um, and in this case you need to consider, do I need to give FFP or other factors? Do I need to give platelets? You know, does this patient have a risk factor like gestational thrombocytopenia, help syndrome, severe preeclampsia, which is causing uh, what would otherwise be a minor um, trauma to, to bleed significantly? And in the worst case, you may need to consider um, activating your massive transfusion protocol if the patient is truly unstable. Um, so if you remember these four um, causes on this side of the board, and if you remember this general approach to postpartum hemorrhage after a, a vaginal delivery, you're going to be able to effectively treat most cases. Um, we can consider uh, the specific cases of after a cesarean delivery or um, a case that's unresponsive to any of these measures in another lesson. Thanks.